Um, thank you guys for joining us today for this week's Virtual Literary Society. Um, just, just to kick things off, I'm gonna start out by introducing myself and then the organization, and then I'll introduce tonight's author. Uh, my name is Adam Ramsey. I am the manager of engagement for Indie Reads. Um, basically what that means is I do a lot with social media and website, uh, graphic design, pretty much a media catch-all. Um, Indie Reads, uh, it's pretty simple. Our mission is 100% literacy for all. Um, so we're based out of Indianapolis and we provide free literacy, English language, and workforce readiness programs to adults through our community classrooms at sites around Marion County. Um, as a lot of people know, we also have a bookstore that is currently under construction in Fountain Square. Uh, we carry new books as well as used books, all of which are donated by the community. Um, and since the pandemic, we now have an online bookstore set up as well through Bookshop, which you can reach at indiereads.org slash shop. Uh, you can order books 24 seven and they'll ship directly to your home and the proceeds will still benefit our adult literacy program. Tonight, uh, we are super excited to have Denise Testa, author of Defending the Dillager Gang, Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins in the courtroom. Uh, Denise is originally from Northwest Ohio, but currently lives and works in Western New York State. She's provided research for several books on early Ohio attorneys, and pre-COVID, she served as a docent at the Susan B. Anthony National Museum and House in Rochester, New York. Um, there is a slight chance that maybe uh, Winston, her dog, will appear in the screen at some point as well, so just be aware that that could happen. Um, also, as I mentioned, our bookstore is entirely online right now while we are under construction. And if you are interested in purchasing Denise's book, which you should be, there is now a link in the chat. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Denise. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are super excited to hear all about the Dillinger gang and these two incredible lawyers. Um, so it's all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me here. Now let's see if I can handle the, uh, uh, up, 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 up. I'm trying to find a share of the screen and here we go. Just bear with me. And I think I think we've got it, by golly. So again, I really wanted to thank Indy Reads Books for, uh, for having me here. And uh, we're off to the races. John Dillinger certainly wasn't the first of the notorious Depression era outlaws to turn up in my part of Ohio. Charles Pretty Boy Floyd and Floyd Barrow both staged robberies in 1930, a good three years before John Dillinger in true Wild West style, looted the Citizens National Bank of Bluffton. He proceeded to shoot his way out of town after unwittingly triggering the bank's alarm, setting off a chain of events still being hotly debated by the time I arrived on the scene. And if I've recorded every colorful tale heard during my childhood about an encounter with John Dillinger on that hot, humid day in mid-August, we'd easily be into a book of epic links. But there was one story which stayed with me. My uh, maternal grandmother was a woman who, shall we say, was before her time. She was the youngest in a Mennonite family of six and a free thinker, and she hardly fit into the accepted mold. At an early age, she struck out on her own, and in between marriages, while working as a waitress at the only spot where Route 30, the old Lincoln Highway, and Route 25, the Dixie Highway, intersected, Grandma crossed paths with a gentleman who had the bluest eyes she ever seen. The encounter must have been memorable because her vivid description of Harry Pierpont, triggerman for the Dillinger gang, given to an 11-year-old granddaughter certainly made an impression. Years later, when I was sitting cross-legged on dusty floor in a countless, one of the countless back rooms that I frequented, while I was deep into a decade's worth of research on Dylan Journey's friends, I realized the details my grandmother shared were not part of any public record. Settled among the reams of yellow transcripts and miles of microfish, there existed plenty on Harry Pierpont, none of it positive, and it was really difficult for me to reconcile that with what I'd been told. I planned to use the information for the basis of a book, but I was really having a hard time finding a fresh angle that uh, there had already been so much written about John Dillinger at that time. So I 
frustrated, I, I turned to another project and until an odd turn of events, inspiration arrived. The research that I'd done for another author's book was taking on new life. Some of the early 20th century murder trials he'd written about were being turned into a courtroom reenactments presented by the local historical society. And this is a group in Dayton, Ohio, that every year they do an old uh, um, reenactment of an old case file. So uh, I was uh, part of the audience for one of these productions and I complimented the director on what a great performance the actress on the witness stand was giving. And she agreed with me, but added that female roles in all these cases had been limited. The actresses either played the wife, the victim, or some combination of the previous two. Evidently, there weren't any women lawyers who showed up in court back then, she remarked with a shrug. That got me thinking. I remembered a woman who'd been part of some of the Dillinger cases. Her name was Jessie Levy, but little had been written about her. Once I started digging, Bess Robbins, another attorney who'd been involved with the gang, turned up. And uh, like my grandmother, both these women definitely held a different mindset. Together, they'd end up representing six of the Dillinger gang, a number far greater than their male counterparts. And yet their names have all but vanished from the records. So when I started researching about them, I was totally shocked when I found out these, both of these attorneys had left behind a treasure trove of interviews, articles, personal correspondence, and of course, we had the court transcripts. And this had all lain untouched for probably close to over 80 years. How they got involved with Dillinger and why either of them would risk a career they struggled so hard to realize by representing some of history's most notorious outlaws are questions that Jesse and Bess are able to answer in their own words. And we are taken back to a time when women practicing criminal law were held in the same low regard as the clients they served. So I'll get off reading here a little bit from my, my uh, Uh, book and just talk a little bit about what the what it was kind of like this what the stage was like at the time that Jesse and Beth began uh, practicing law. Women um, women got into the field of law probably about five decades before the 19th Amendment was ratified in August of 1920. Uh, however, many of those women they weren't considered real lawyers. They were limited um, to they were forced to accept jobs as either a stenographer or as a law librarian. They never really got to get into court. Um, most of the women that did, did continue on with it ended up going into a practice with a family member, either a father, brother, or husband, or if they did strike out on their own, they were really limited to the areas of tax, general corporate, securities, real estate, and trust and estate work. And even then, if they were working in some of those areas, they were still uh, undercut. Uh, Ter Clarence Darrow maintained that women are too Kind to succeed as corporation lawyers, they cannot fight the soulless trusts. So few women really showed up in court in those days. They found few women found work in litigation, and very few, very few practiced on a regular basis in criminal law. Um, by this time, in the by 1920, all the states did admit women into the bar. However, not all the states allowed women to serve on juries. There were far too many lawyers. There were far too many judges that believed that women didn't belong in the courtroom in, in any capacity. So I'm gonna give you one more quote and this kind of summarizes it up. Women make good law students. They can pass examinations, including bar examinations with honors and flying colors. The conditions are such that they do not seem to me equipped for the actual knockdown and drag out fight required in the actual trial of lawsuits. This is a quote, this came from a gentleman who was a defense attorney in Chicago in the 1920s. His name was William Scott Stewart. If any of you happen to watch the uh, musical uh, uh, Chicago, the movie musical Chicago, this was the character that the Billy Flynn, the, the uh, Richard Gere character, was, was based off of. So as you can see, it really wasn't a, a, a time that women were really re uh, welcomed into the courtroom. Indianapolis was a little bit different. And if you get a chance to uh, go over to the uh, Indiana Historical Bureau, there's a blog up right now that's about uh, six of the early um, Indianapolis attorneys. And I'm gonna just talk real quickly about uh, these two. Uh, Adele Stork, who's the lady on the left, and Elizabeth uh, M. Mason, uh, the lady on the right, started a law firm in 1923. And they were one of the first in the country, if not the, the first to, to do that. So this was kind of set Indianapolis a little bit aside, made them a little bit more unique. It was almost like they were an incubator for women to be able to succeed a little more with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, in the law field. So 
This is one of the ladies that I wrote about. This is Miss Jessie Levy. This is in 1924. This was about uh, three years after she graduated law school. She had been born in Siena, Russia, and uh, at uh, that back then it was in Russia. Today it's on the uh, northeast border of Poland. And she was born in July 4th of uh, 19, uh, or excuse me, 1898. She was the eldest of four da daughters, and she was born into an Orthodox Jewish family. When she was uh, um, six years old in June of 1904, they immigrated over here to the United States. So they moved around a bit and they ended up in, in South Bend, Indiana. And uh, they kind of bumped around for a while. When Jessie was 16 years old, she had to drop out of school to uh, take a job because they didn't, um, the, the family needed money. And uh, she was very smart. She was a really good student. So she ended up, she found a job with an uh, attorney in a local law firm in South Bend. And she worked as a typist in his office. And then she also worked as a reporter for the local newspaper. So um, um, she began to get the bug that she wanted to try and become an attorney. But at that time, um, it was really tough in Indiana. Um, so we're talking probably uh, 1914, somewhere around there. There were a few women that were practicing in, in the state. But again, like I said, it was really limited to what they were, were doing. But she decided to pursue it, and she uh, um, started taking night classes. And in 1918, she became the first woman admitted to the Indiana University School of Law. And um, excuse me, because she dropped out of high school when she was 16, she was going to high school at Short Ridge High School during the day. So she was taking classes during the day. She was taking night classes for law school, and she also managed to kind of get in there where she was uh, working as a law clerk for a local judge. So she was a busy, busy, busy lady. So um, the thing that probably really kind of spurred Jesse on um, is in Indiana in 1917, they had a, uh, they passed partial suffrage during the summer, and um, it, it got immediately challenged, and uh, it, it got uh, overturned by the state Supreme Court, I believe, in October. And that's the uh, second article you see there where it's the woman, women loses her ballot, um, the, especially that last line, it will come, girls, don't be discouraged. And in this case, you know, a country governed by law. That article was a, an editorial that appeared in the South Bend, uh, Indiana newspaper, and that was where Jesse was working as a, as a uh, uh, reporter and it really incensed her and this is probably kind of the event that really kind of pushed her to decide that she was going to go to law school she was going to do all these things so she was uh, um, like I said she really got upset about the, this, the partial suffrage being uh, overturned and didn't like that letter that the editor wrote so she wrote her own letter to back to the editor and it was a long one I, if you I have see the whole thing it ran from top to bottom it was a solid column and she really wrote I'm excerpt out just a, a little bit of that so you can see what she's what she's saying but um, throughout this thing she was involved a lot with with the Dillinger gang she did represent other other people in criminal cases uh, murder cases robbery that type of thing but first and foremost she was a suffragist um, in her later writings like I said again she felt like this was the impetus this was what gave her, gave her the impetus to go on she wanted to focus on women's issues, especially married women who often lacked kind of the legal means to uh, control their own destiny. So that was, this was kind of the, the, the beginnings of it. And I'm skipping way ahead, uh, this is Jesse Levy back in, in 1966. Um, so they talked to her a little bit about how, how it was when the 19th Amendment got passed. And I thought she made some pretty, pretty good points. Um, I think the best one was, though, that she told the reporter not to expect suffrage to automatically change things except for giving us the right to vote. So kind of interesting. So how did a woman who was into um, women's issues and things like that, how the heck did she get involved with the John Dillinger gig? Well, the first couple of years of Jessie's practice, because she started out in 1921 and she was uh, went on her own. She didn't join a law firm. Um, in 1925, uh, she took on a case for a gentleman called Earl Northern, and uh, he was called Earl the Kid Northern, and uh, he was already a, um, um, hard, he was 22 years old. He wasn't that old, but he'd already uh, been in and out of prison a few times and uh, things. So she was representing him um, for a, a bank robbery that um, he was involved with. And uh, this was going to be her first, this was her first um, major criminal career. And uh, the 
the stakes were kind of high because he was thought of as a three-time offender. And at the time, what they were doing with the three-time offenders was you ended up with a lifetime sentence in prison. So this was a, this was a big, uh, this was a very big deal. So um, Jesse, uh, the other thing that was kind of interesting, this was, like I said, her first case. Um, back in the day, you know, we didn't have television. Radio was a little, little not, not uh, just kind of coming in. People would go to the court to, uh, for entertainment if they wanted something to do. It's kind of like watching soap operas in a way. And uh, what would happen, uh, uh, there were, again, like I said, there weren't many women. They were considered novelties in the, you know, as, a, as attorneys. And uh, for this particular case, the courtroom was packed. They had people standing, uh, standing in the aisles because everybody wanted to come and see a woman, woman practice. So if you can imagine, this is her first, this is her first, your first big case, your criminal case, and here you have everybody is, is, is uh, checking you out. The gentleman that's on the, the uh, left-hand side of the screen was a gentleman by the name of Harry Pierpont, handsome Harry Pierpont. Now, I talked about him a little bit earlier. That was the, the uh, gentleman that my, my grandmother had met at one time. And uh, what uh, Jesse was able to do in the, this trial, she used Harry Pierpont as a, as a witness, a key witness, and she was able to get a better outcome than they expected with, with Harry Pierpont. And he remembered that. Harry Pierpont would go on to be known as the mentor for John Dillinger. And he's also been credited uh, with being the brains behind the uh, Dillinger gang. So again, like I said, 1925, that was the first time that they, they, those two met up. The second lady that I'd like to talk about is Bess Robbins. She was a little bit younger than, than Jesse. She was born in 1904, and um, she went to the same law school. Um, she, was, her, uh, she was born in the United States. Her parents uh, immigrated over from Eastern Russia as well. Um, she was um, really involved in politics. And as you can see there, she wrote a letter to the editor, and I think she was probably about 17 years old, 18 years old, when she wrote that letter, I, it's just, it's, it, to me, it's just really fascinating that these, the, I, I know how I was at that age and uh, that they were as uh, deep thinking and as involved in the issues as they were at, at such a young age. Um, Bess graduated on her 21st birthday from law school. And she actually had to wait. She was graduated before uh, she could actually practice law. So she, she had to, to hold out a little bit. Um, for about a year, she worked for a local law firm, but she wanted to, uh, she ended up leaving to set up her own practice because she really wanted to, to uh, practice criminal law. That was one of the things she was interested in. So like um, Bessie, she had a big case that kind of brought her to the forefront. She had probably about four or five years where she was kind of just bumping around, uh, you know, trying to get uh, um, known. And this happened to be the case that, that made her known. And you got to love these, this, this graphic. Um, you got the baby down there on the, the uh, lower right-hand corner. Things didn't happen quite as, 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 it, as, as that picture shows. But um, what had happened was a lady who had a young, he was about a year old uh, toddler, uh, had been uh, left by her husband. And the boarding house that she was in, they kicked her out one afternoon. And uh, with just the clothes on her back, her and the baby's back, and she had nothing. And she decided that she was, that for whatever reason, she was young, she was 19 years old. Um, she decided that she would leave this, her son, um, on the doorstep of this house that was in a rich neighborhood in, in Indianapolis and knock on the door and, and run off. And that was, that was what she did. Well, she didn't realize that the people didn't come to the door. So this baby, I guess, crawled off the, the doorstep and things like that. And it started to rain. That's how he became known as, as the rain baby. Well, what happened was um, uh, everyone was very indignant about this. I, that it was, this was how horrible this was. And uh, she got arrested and she confessed right away and it, it admitted what happened and things started to kind of change. And back in those days, you didn't have a public defender's office. You had, um, so if somebody didn't have enough money for an attorney, it was kind of tough luck. But the bar, uh, Indianapolis Bar Association decided this was an interesting case. This lady had was, you know, seemed to be, need the help. So they were looking for an attorney that would take it. And they actually volunteered that they would provide an attorney. And then they found that they didn't have any other attorneys that belonged to the bar that wanted to take it. The only person that would, would volunteer was actually was Bess Robbins. And she took this case and she turned it around for, for, um, um, the rain baby's mother. And this was something, 
it wasn't just a local case. This was something that got covered not only throughout the Midwest, but you'd see articles about this mentioning this, you know, throughout the country. This was a big case. The other thing I just want to say about this was when this came to trial, the uh, there were uh, besides the judge and the bailiff, there were only two other men that were in the the audience. The audience, the courtroom was packed. They had people standing. This was in May, I think, when they had this. Um, yeah, when they had this. They had people standing outside with the windows open to hear this case, these women. Everybody was really interested how this was gonna turn out because it, it, was, it was something that was so, so different, so unique. And uh, Bess uh, pulled it from the fires and uh, a lot of people remembered her for that. So I'm gonna move on. She was also, in 1933, she ended up being elected to the uh, House of Representatives. And, uh, she uh, was one of the first women to be elected and she was the first to actually serve three consecutive terms. Um, and it's kind of cool in this article, and I have this article up on my website, um, so you can read it a little bit easier, but the, she's quoted in here as saying, she enjoys her criminal work perhaps more than any other phase, and in the future she hoped for a straight murder case, her nearest being a case of assault and battery with intent to kill. So she, she was into, into a lot of prison reform, and uh, things like that. So she really got known for, for that type of thing. Here's the other little tidbit that's kind of interesting to me. She was, um, Jesse Levy was a Republican. Bess um, Robbins would be considered what we consider a, an FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Democrat. And when Governor McNutt got elected governor for Indiana, Bess was one of a group of, of people that met with him and convinced him that, there, that the parole system needed to be reformed. And one of the prisoners that got, one of the convicts that got the benefit of best meeting with Governor McNutt was John Dillinger. So uh, that's kind of like a little, little interesting tie-in. So I've talked a little bit about the ladies. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Dillinger gang. Um, it's kind of interesting. John Dillinger had a really short career, pretty short career really as a bank robber. Before, uh, when he was in the uh, Indiana State Penitentiary of Michigan City, um, he hadn't robbed a bank. But he hung out with a group of a clique of bank robbers because they were kind of in, a little bit on the higher echelon. He um, actually his bank robbing career was probably somewhere late May, early June of 1933 through July of 1934. So again, not that not that long. But what happened was they saw this group of bank robbers that he was what he was hanging with saw that he was going to get paroled earlier than them, and so they kind of hatched this scheme that they were going to try and break out of the prison, and they decided that John Dillinger would be the, the uh, outside man. So these, these, this group of uh, mug shots that you see to the uh, left hand of the screen, um, that was part of the group. It was kind of a, a, a group that kind of came and go, went. You had um, probably about 10, 12 um, of the prisoners, and some would come and some would go on that. But uh, so John Dillinger got released in May of, uh, May 10th of 1933, courtesy, uh, uh, Governor McNutt uh, paroled him and said that his uh, sentence had actually been excessive and it, um, that he needed to be, be released. And what happened was um, once he was out, he started robbing banks. And one of the banks that I talked about um, in my uh, intro was the Bluffton Bank. That was where I was born and raised. And uh, he was earning all this money for bribes and guns and whatever else that they decided that they were going to need for this breakout. And uh, about two days before, I think it was the September 22nd, he uh, got arrested in Dayton, Ohio. He was visiting a girlfriend, and um, uh, he got arrested before the prison break. And uh, what happened was the, um, uh, his attorney got him transferred to a little jail in Lyme, Ohio. There's Winston. Um, rather than going back to Indiana. He robbed some banks in Indiana. I think one on the Massachusetts State's state uh, bank was over $25,000, something like that. And um, he had, uh, uh, had had that. And actually, when they caught him, he was carrying some of that money that he robbed from that bank was in the bank wrappers, you know, so they had a pretty good case that he could go, should have gone back to Indiana, but his, his attorney could cut a deal. When these prisoners, these 10 convicts escaped, um, they uh, uh, found out about this and they decided that they were going to return the favor that they were going to break him up. So what happened was, this is a picture on the, the left-hand side, is a picture of the sheriff's resident. And kind of behind it, you can see that's what the, where the jail was. And to the right of that is uh, the courthouse, the Allen County Courthouse. So um, they, um, 
decided that they were going to, like I said, break him out. So on October 12th, five escaped prisoners, it was Harry Pierpont, Charles Makeley, Russell Clark, Ed Schaus, and Jen Hamilton, and along with this gentleman by the name of Harry Copeland, who had uh, um, was part of the uh, Buff Bluffton Bank robbery, uh, they came into Lima to break him out. Well, things got heated, and Harry Pierpont shot and then pistol whipped Sheriff, the sheriff, it was Sheriff Jess Sarber, during the jailbreak. And as a result, Sheriff Sarber died of, the, the, uh, of uh, his injuries. And so now we had, on October 12th, not only do we have a jailbreak, but uh, we, we had uh, a, a murder of a law enforcement officer. So what happened was, uh, as soon as they got out, they didn't waste much time getting, getting, the, getting into the trouble. Uh, their first stop was two days later. They actually went to a police station in Auburn, Indiana, and they waited. It was kind of the, the uh, uh, shift change at the graveyard, right around midnight at the graveyard shift. And they went in and they stole uh, all their ammunition, all their guns, that type of thing, um, so that they could get armed up and start, start robbing banks. And uh, they called them initially, before they called them, started calling them the, the Dillinger Gang, the newspapers were calling them the Terror Gang because they basically really struck terror throughout the heart of, of uh, uh, the Midwest. They robbed a bank in uh, uh, Greencastle, Indiana, uh, Racine, Wisconsin, and East Chicago in the um, uh, Indiana. And in the process, three more officers of the law died during these robberies or during these, these times when they were trying to, to catch the gang. So, um, and this started to really make a lot of headlines throughout the country. I mean, this was something that people hadn't, hadn't seen before. You had kind of a, a synergy thing going because you had John Dillinger going, you had Pretty Boy Floyd going, you had uh, the Barrow Gang, uh, Bonnie, Bonnie Parker, Clyde Barrow going. So this was something that the newspapers picked up on and really, really ran with it. So the first member of the Dillinger gang to get caught was Harry Copeland. And Harry Copeland was the first of Bess Robbins' clients. And he happened to get picked up in, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and um, they uh, got some information out of him. They sent him to, to Indianapolis uh, to question him. And um, what happened was Harry Copeland was originally from Muncie, Indiana. And his mother still lives in Muncie. And this was the uh, uh, headline and a snippet from the Muncie paper uh, right around when he got caught. And uh, as you can see, a dead bandit is far more useful to society than one who's behind bars. So, I mean, she read that and said, oh my goodness, my son. She hired an attorney and they went to Indianapolis uh, to meet with her son. And the attorney she hired decided not to take the case. Uh, but she really wanted to get somebody. So she started thinking about it and she was one of the women who had followed the Rain Baby case that Bess Robbins had, had in 1930. They hired Bess Robbins to, rep, to uh, represent Harry Copeland. So I'm going to let Harry Copeland hold for just a second. And this is the second of uh, Bess Robbins' clients. This is Hilton Crouch. And Hilton Crouch was famous around Indianapolis. He was a dirt track race car driver. So, uh, um, which was kind of a handy skill if you were also into bank robberies because he was the one they always got to drive the getaway car. So uh, Hilton Crouch um, had, uh, you know, he was kind of in and out of trouble with the law from like the, like about say 1923 on. And uh, he got arrested um, uh, for a, a robbery, the Duesenberg um, factory robbery. They robbed a payroll at the Duesenberg factory. And he ended up at uh, Michigan City at the Indiana State Penitentiary. And uh, he met, that's where he met John Dillinger. So when John Dillinger got paroled and when John Dillinger was looking for somebody to drive his getaway car, this is who, who he got. So when uh, Hilton Crouch got uh, arrested, Bess Robbins ended up with him too. I'm not quite sure how the whole story on that one went, but uh, it was kind of interesting. So the big thing was they, the Chicago police were really lucky. They caught a couple of these members of the Dillinger gang but they were trying to figure out where John Dillinger was, where Harry Pierpont was, where Charles Makeley was. Well, they happened to be in warmer climates. They'd actually spent the, uh, Christmas and New Year's down in Florida, and then the group dispersed, and they ended up in Tucson, Arizona. And what happened was um, two of the gang members stayed, this is where we're talking about this hotel fire, two of them stayed at this hotel, it was called the Hotel, or it is called the Hotel Congress, it's still there now, they were on the third floor and this hotel fire broke out. 
and uh, they couldn't go down any of the stairs because of the fire. So they were coming out the, on these uh, firemen's ladders. Well, the problem was the baggage that they had was loaded down with money that they had stolen, was also loaded down with Tommy guns. It was really, really heavy. And they were trying to get the, uh, they were trying to get the firemen talked into bringing all their stuff, all their trunks down the ladders and things like that. And um, there's always been a little bit of question as to why uh, or what, um, what exactly happened. One of the versions was Charles Makeley was so relieved when they got the firemen talked into to bringing down his trunk that he gave a, a, a greater than normal tip, <laughs> more than he should have and called attention to himself. And then that fireman remembered his face and uh, happened to see his picture. Uh, you know, back in the day, they had these true crime magazines, these true detective and, and uh, whatnot, and saw his picture in one of these magazines and put two and two together. So the Tucson police realized they had some of the Dillinger gang in town. So what happened was, they, uh, after the fire, Charles Makeley and Russell Clark, went, uh, they rented a house. And this was the house that they rented. It was on North Avenue. And Harry Pierpont and John Dillinger were also in town. They weren't staying at the house. They were staying at a, a um, motor inn, but they were in Tucson as well. So the Tucson police set up a sting operation. They um, uh, basically waited. They picked them off kind of one at a time. They waited until Makeley went, was uh, going to a radio uh, store and they arrested him at the store. They went back to the, uh, the house and Russell Clark was there with his, his wife, Bernice Long. And um, they knocked on the door and they said that they had a message. And they, what they had done was all these gentlemen, they didn't use their real names. They were using aliases. So they, um, uh, they had this one cop that was younger, looked younger than the rest. And they, they, of course, didn't have him in a uniform. They sent him up and he said he had a message from Mr. Davies and, and he needed to deliver it to, to, uh, um, to him. And uh, basically uh, what uh, happened was they picked off each of these members of the Dillinger gang without a shot being fired, which was totally amazing because again, keep in mind, you had three officers of the law that had gotten, had died in, in the Midwest on these shootouts with the gang. And here Tucson was just picking them off one by one by one. They, uh, uh, it, it was totally astonishing. And uh, you had the press, this was kind of the first time that you really had the press um, with like newsreels and radio announcers and things like that um, here in the, for their arraignment. I mean, it was a big, it, it was a really big thing. It made the headlines throughout the country. So um, what happened was the uh, officials from these different states where they robbed banks all descended on Tucson because they wanted to, uh, everybody wanted a piece of the pie, if you will, or everybody wanted to uh, have, get the, the Dillinger gang because again, they were, they were very famous. So they kind of wrangled things out and they decided that uh, Dillinger was gonna be sent back to Indiana because he had been in a bank robbery, the East Chicago bank robbery up in Lake County and an officer of the law had gotten killed up there. So they were sending him up there to stand for a murder trial. And they decided that Clark, Makeley, and Pierpont would, uh, uh, they were gonna go back to the, because they were state, escaped convicts, they were gonna send him back to the Indiana State uh, Penitentiary. And um, so that's, that's kind of the deal they, they did. Um, in the meantime, um, I talked about Earl Northern. He was supposed to be one of the ones who had escaped along with the, the other 10. And uh, he was sick. He had gotten tuberculosis. So he happened to be in the uh, uh, penitentiary uh, hospital at the time. So he couldn't escape with the rest of them. But his younger sister, Mary Kinder, Mary Northern Kinder, she had struck up a, a, a prison romance with Harry Pierpont. So she happened to be with Harry Pierpont when they got arrested in, in uh, Tucson, Arizona. So the papers kind of took this and really ran with this. I mean, Mary Kinder, yes, she helped the gang, but she did not definitely was not the leader of the, the uh, the, uh, the Dillinger gang. But as a result, what was interesting when they arraigned him in Tucson, um, she got arraigned along with the, the gang. They put her bail the same as, the, the, as John Dillinger's and, and the rest of the gang at $100,000, which was a lot of money she was not going to be making that, making that bail. And because Jesse Levy had represented her brother earlier on, this was how she, this was kind of her introduction into the uh, uh, this was her first Dillinger gang um, um, client. So what happened was John Dillinger ended up um, going back to Crown Point and the press, I mean, when he landed, when the, they, they flew him back on a private plane. And when the plane landed in Chicago, there was a crowd at night, you know, it was cold. It's February, January. Uh, they're waiting for him. I mean, he's really, really beloved. 
the uh, and people were astonished by it. I mean, um, like uh, at the, the time, it was not called the FBI. It was a direct the Bureau of Investigation. J. Edgar Hoover was was just really angered by this. Um, in this picture, the lady who is there in the front row is Sheriff Lillian Holly. She was going to be the one keeping John Dillinger. Her husband had started out originally as the, the sheriff, and he was killed in, in the line of duty, so she became the, the sheriff. Uh, the gentleman in the center there was the uh, um, um, county prosecutor, uh, Robert Estill. And his, basically, his career got derailed because you can kind of see where John Dillinger's, how John Dillinger's got his hand on his shoulder and things. People really uh, um, uh, did not like that, I guess, is the best way to put it. In Lima, um, what was happening was Ohio wanted all five of the Dillinger gangs. So they wanted Harry Pierpont, Charles Makeley, Russell Clark, um, Harry Copeland, and um, uh, another gentleman by the name of Ed Schaus. And they wanted to bring them back to uh, Ohio. The picture you see there is of the National Guard. They actually even called out the, uh, some of the National Guard and set up machine gun nests around the, the, the jail and, and set it around the court, courthouse. Just, um, you know, again, in preparation. Um, what had happened was, though, Ohio made a deal with Indiana that they would help pay for the money to bring these, these gangsters back from Tucson. They'd split the cost if they could get these men. And um, um, this is kind of where it, it became a turning point for Bess's, Bess Robbins' career because uh, she had to kind of choose between playing politics or doing what was right for her client. Um, she uh, was representing Harry Copeland, and she came across a statute, um, an old statute, I think it was from 1905 in, in, from Indiana, that said um, for the state, if you had somebody that was indicted for a crime in the state of Indiana, they could not be extradited to another state until they stood, um, stood um, uh, for the uh, uh, crime that they had in Indiana. She used this to block the, uh, the extradition of Harry Copeland. And this really threw a monkey wrench into things. And this is something that never came to light till about, you know, probably uh, just a few months ago for me, or not a few months ago, about a year ago for me. Um, basically for a week, she kept going back and forth to the governor's office and telling him about this statute and saying, you know, this is my client, I'm gonna get him out. He's not gonna go to Ohio. And they basically tried to ignore. They, they just kinda, yeah, yeah, best and, and let it go. And finally, it came Friday, and she told the governor, I'm going to do a, a file a writ. And the kind of the, the kicker of this, or the gotcha of this, was those other men who were supposed to go to Ohio, that same statute, that would work for them. And that was really going to throw a monkey wrench into things. So um, basically, what they did was load everybody up, <laughs> except for Harry Copeland, and take them to Ohio in mass. Originally, they were going to take them one by one. So the problem with this was the meter started running. You, had the you brought in more National Guard in you know it was just a whole different a whole different ball game and what's kind of interesting is until i wrote this book um there was a, a very nice lady with the uh, indiana uh, archives who dug up out of harry copeland's prison prison packet um uh, letters from Bess robbins and uh, from the warden and from the governor you know talking about this and they had kept this thing buried because you had no idea that that this had actually had actually went on this particular little newspaper clipping came from Munster and that was the only one I could ever find. But, um, um, you know, basically they, uh, they weren't going to get Harry Copeland. So they, they sent a great gangster trio to Ohio to face a murder count. So this was on February 10th. They loaded everybody up. Lima wasn't even ready for them. They had guys standing out uh, outside of the jail, uh, putting up a stockade fence when the gangsters arrived. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was really kind of crazy. Um, things didn't go real well for uh, the uh, gentleman in Ohio for, for Pierpont, Bakley, and, and Clark. Um, they, uh, they really discouraged any local attorneys from taking them on. And the attorneys that they got, um, some of them uh, ended up dropping out of the case. The uh, one um, attorney that was for Harry Pierpont was also worked part-time as a solicitor for the city of Lima. And uh, he ended up filing a libel suit because they, people were just could not understand why uh, it, the city solicitor would also represent these part time, uh, um, you know, a, a Dillinger gangster, even though in the past it was OK to to uh, to do that. They now it was not uh, not such a great thing. So uh, what uh, happened was back in Indianapolis, things weren't going well in Ohio, but back in Indianapolis, things were things were going a little bit better. Basically, the prosecution couldn't find any evidence to link Mary Kinder 
up with um, um, what they were charging her with. And it took Jesse Levy probably about three weeks, three court appearances and a writ of habeas corpus to get Mary out, but she got her out. And the gentleman you see on the, the left there is Frank, Judge Frank P. Baker. And if there was, there was times when, you know, I wish I could go back in time and be a fly on the wall. Uh, any of the times that Jesse and Bess dealt with this, this judge would have, been, would have been some of those times because he was a character. Um, very, very, they, he was known as the fieriest uh, judge to ever sit on the, the criminal court bench. Uh, one of the quotes that got attributed to him was, if I'm not part of, uh, of a group, I'm against that group. So, I mean, he was, he was a tough, kind of a tough cookie. And so you can see there what he, what, uh, he had warned Mary to stay away from uh, Lima, but she said, well, Harry's a swell fellow and I'm going uh, to stick with him. So what muddied things up even further was two days before Harry Pierpont was going to stand trial, John Dillinger escaped from jail. And uh, they were actually his attorney, this, that Charles Long that you saw in the, uh, the news clipping, and his parents uh, were headed up to Crown Point. They were going to do a deposition with Don Dillinger. And they got there. It was about an hour later, and John Dillinger was already on the road. He had stolen the uh, Sheriff Lillian Holly's car, and he was, he was out. <laughs> what uh, happened was his attorney dropped out. He dropped out the night before the case. The picture you see there on the right-hand side of the of the thing are the is a prosecution team. The gentleman in the center was the the lead attorney Ernest Botkin, and um, uh, the gentleman with the cigar was Joseph Flick, and the gentleman in the white fedora is uh, ben, Benjamin Motter. And what was happening was the um, the prosecution, the judge, the, they were being followed around, and they had a, a escort of national guardsmen that that stayed with them. So there was a hotel across the street from the courthouse and everybody was staying there, including the jurors. And so you'd have this contingent of uh, national guardsmen marching the, the uh, uh, prosecution team and marching the, the judge back and forth, you know, and the jur jurors all got to, got to see that. So the prosecution really was kind of uh, happy because they got rid of pretty much any competent attorney in the area that, that uh, was going to represent these folks. And uh, the morning of the trial, Jesse Levy showed up, and they were astounded. Um, to say that she wasn't wanted in the courtroom would probably be an understatement. Um, when she was interviewing prospective jurors, the, uh, when she started the questioning, uh, the National Guard would start up uh, with target practice outside of the courtroom. So, I mean, again, again, like I said, there's a lot of just crazy stuff that went on. Um, security was really tight. Uh, Everybody who was associated with trying to get in to, for the, the trial, to get into actually even the courthouse, was subjected to a standard Detective Bureau body search. And so again, like I said, it's crazy. The picture you see there, it's uh, Jesse, obviously there on the, the uh, left hand. Clarence Miller uh, was attorney for Russell Clark. He was just fresh out of law school. He was probably about a year or two out of law school. So uh, that was kind of what the prosecution actually wanted for a, a defense attorney. The gentleman in the middle is William Fogarty. He was an attorney in Indiana. He did not practice. He was a bank president. And the people, two people on the outside um, are uh, Harry Pierpont's parents. So uh, what happened, as you can see there, we've got Harry Pierpont. Um, during the second day of Harry Pierpont's trial, John Dillinger and his new gang, which included Babyface Nelson, robbed the Security National Bank and Trust Company of Sioux Falls in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So again, like I said, it, it was really crazy. You had uh, armed, like you're seeing right there, the gentleman that's standing behind her, is just behind Harry Pierpont, is Don Sarber, and he was the son of the slain sheriff, and he became the replacement sheriff. So originally, Jesse was going to re uh, represent just Harry Pierpont. Charles Makeley's attorney dropped out too, so she ended up uh, uh, replacing him as well. And just kind of a little tidbit with him, before the sheriff had died, that they had shot, he uh, had told them that they were all big men that had come in to the office. And uh, Makeley was probably actually a lookout on the outside because Makeley was one of the shorter um, members of the group. I think he was about five foot seven. Uh, Harry Pierpont, Harry Copeland, and Russell Clark were all in that six foot, uh, six foot range. But anyway, Jesse ended up getting him. And then the third man she represented was Russell Clark. And what was kind of also crazy about this was because, again, they had planned originally that they were going to do each of these trials 
one man at a, a time, you know, bring them individually from the penitentiary. Now they had them all sitting in Lima. So they were running these trials back to back. So what would happen would be once one trial would go, uh, you know, go to the, the jury, they'd get ready and have another one. So in the case of Russell Clark, I think uh, they came up with a verdict for Charles Makeley on a Saturday. They started Russell Clark up on a Monday. I'm saying it was, you know, these would end up on the weekend. One, one uh, verdict would come in and they would start back up and, and go with another. And kind of the kicker with that was the court transcripts were being delayed. So you couldn't go back. There were discrepancies in the witness statements in you know, the testimony, but it was really hard to go back and start comparing this stuff because it was, it, everything was so delayed. So I will kind of stop there with the trials. The four jailbreaks, three murder trials, two stays of execution and a dismissal, this came these headlines. And that top one is actually courtesy of the uh, uh, special agent in charge of the, what was, would be called the FBI in Indianapolis, uh, Agent Reineke. And he was at a, a, a meeting of uh, women attorneys in Indianapolis. And actually Jesse Levy was a program chairwoman. And I think he was supposed to give something a different talk, but this was what he, this is what he talked about. So, uh, you know, how, when you look at these clippings, I mean, it really kind of runs the gamut of what they, uh, what they thought about these women. Um, and when books went for John Dillinger and the Dillinger gang were beginning to enter the marketplace, Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins just basically vanished from the record. They, it became a boys only club with just a handful of passing references told from the perspective of what made a good story rather than anything kind of pertaining to fact. And, you know, while all these stories are really fascinating, I enjoy, I can sit here and talk all night about the, that. There's another area I just want to talk about real quickly that Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins, you know, this is where they really made their most lasting contribution. The 19th Amendment didn't guarantee any woman the vote. Instead, the laws reserved the ballot for men became unconstitutional. So women still had to navigate a maze of state laws to exercise their right. So these women, Jesse and Bess, their unwillingness to back down from the causes they believe in, as they demonstrated with the Dillinger gang, really served them well. Both attorneys fought against and they defeated legislation designed to restrict women's access to the courtroom and to the polls. And history may have forgotten about Jesse leaving Bess Robbins, but the legacy that they left behind is still with us today. So I am happy to answer any and all questions. Let's see if I can get up here and here we go. Good. Any questions? Uh, that I <laughs> That, that's so much to unpack there. Um, I have a lot of questions. Does sure. anyone else have questions that they want to jump in? No? No I takers? Can, I mean, Go ahead. I, can go and start. I, I took a lot of notes while you were going through that yeah. story to try to keep everything or, <laughs> organized. Um, and some of my questions you got to towards the end. Um, I guess starting out before, I, I'm curious about the relationship between Bess Robbins and Jesse Levy and how much their paths crossed because it sounds like they were each working with their own clients. Yes. They were all under the umbrella of the Dillinger gang. And so I, I, I guess I'm wondering about whether or not they were friends, if they worked together on any of this? Good uh, question. Good question. Um, I never found a case where they worked as opposing attorneys. They, both of these women went on to become judges too in uh, the Marion County system. And I never found a case where one was a judge and the other was, was doing a, um, um, defending a client or representing a client. Where they did get together was on legislation. So you started after the 19th Amendment, you started having these what they call protective laws coming into place. And what they were trying to do was restrict uh, like the hours of women, women could work. Like they had one thing that came through that said you could women, all women were only going to be work from the hours of like eight to four or something like that. And this is where Jesse Levy and, and Bess Robbins teamed up together. I mean, they saw each other on a... Uh, you know, they, they were in different, the same professional groups and, and things like that. So, I mean, they definitely did interact and they were within the same kind of social circle, but they didn't, they never shared a law office together or, you know, actually shared, shared clients. Do you think it was competitive between them at all? 
What's that? Do you think there was any sort of competition between the two of them since it was so rare for women to be in their roles? No. It makes me wonder. No. They, uh, if anything, they really did a lot of mentoring. Because again, like I said, you just did not have women in, in the courtroom. Uh, Bess got a chance to do a murder trial then in 1937. And I think Jesse was kind of cheerleading her on because this thing turned into a real um, extravaganza. They ended up, they had a, the first jury was hung and then the second one, I mean, it was a long, it went from 1937 into 1938. Um, so no, they were they were doing a lot of mentorship and, and, and things like that. Seriously, I mean they 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 seem to get along. Um, and keep in mind um, what happened with Jesse too was she got onto uh, uh, Hoover's director Hoover's radar probably in about 1931 1930. And uh, so when she represented the Dillinger gang, they started uh, tapping her phones. <laughs> so they you know they were following her around. I don't think uh, I don't think there was really anything on Bess as far as with the FBI, but uh, definitely with Jesse Levy. Anybody else? I, Luana, did I answer your question? I guess because I know we kind of, kind of, you kind of overlapped with, uh, with uh, what Adam said. Yeah, that you did totally, Denise. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Did um, did the did Jesse or Beth ever have children? Like they seemed like they were so busy working and making a difference. Um, did they ha get married and have families as well? They both got married. Neither one of them had children. Um, Jesse got married in, I believe it was 1937, and I think Bess was 1939. And uh, Jesse married, they both ended up marrying uh, their partners in law practice. And um, the, the book kind of goes into that a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, Denise, uh, I've got a question for you. How did yeah. you come to uh, write this book? And can you uh, discuss with us some of your research materials? Absolutely. I, there's a lot. <laughs> I, got a, I have a heck of a bibliography in the, in the back. I had uh, initially been interested, uh, because again, growing up in Bluffton, or around the Bluffton area, I heard all these stories about John Dillinger and things like that. And then um, I got really kind of interested in the whole Harry Pierpont thing. Well, the problem with Harry Pierpont was he uh, he spent most of his adult life in prison. So there wasn't, I mean, there was, yes, there is things about him, but not as interesting. I, who I started really following was Charles Makeley because he was probably about 15 years older than the rest of the gang. And he was all over the country. So I had a lot of fun kind of trailing him around. And I had originally wanted to, to write something um, about him. And I just never could kind of quite get it, um, buy into it, I guess. And uh, all of a sudden when I, I, you know, I'd always keep saying, oh, somebody should write a book on Jesse Levy. Somebody should write a book on Jesse Levy. And then when I found, uh, um, when I found out the, the, all the stuff that they had that both of these ladies had left, both Bess and Jesse, it was like, oh, this, this thing wrote itself. It really did. So um, as far as research goes, uh, besides the old newspapers as primary resources, um, uh, Jesse had written a newspaper column for a few years, The Legal Problems of Women. And so I had that to draw from. Um, uh, Bess Robbins wrote some things, especially when she was in the House of Representatives. So I had a lot of uh, correspondence and things like that. And, and like I said, I, I got to give props to Vicki Castile of uh, the uh, Indiana Archives because she's the one that located the, all that stuff uh, on the prisoner packet with the uh, uh, Harry Copeland um, and that whole deal. That was just something that just kind of, kind of flew by. But um, that's that was kind of my uh, where, where I got got my things from. Is that uh, did I did I answer? Yeah, just a quick follow up. Uh, how long did it take you to put the book together? I had probably been researching for over ten years when I got. And again, like I said, this was with. The, the whole Dillinger gang, Makeley, that type of thing. So I had a lot of that background material, but the Jesse and Beth stuff, that that was like, it, it, it almost like wrote itself. That was probably two years. That was, it, it, but it fell into place. I think that was kind of the thing because you were really, you know, I was really gung-ho about it. The other thing was they were so into both of them and so worked really hard with the suffragist things that um, um, I kind of wanted to get it out this year because it was the, 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 the 100 years. So I had some impetus, I guess. Anybody else? 
Yeah, what are your what are your next what's your next book? Yeah. <laughs> you I, I, um I'm actually writing one on a lady uh, a, um, a couple of women um Chicago attorneys for 1924. So yeah, in that area. But I right now I'm kind of took a little break from that and just uh, uh pushing on the working on this because what happens is you you write this and there's a lag time and it's, it's like oh my gosh i got to read this again and look all this stuff up so i can so i can answer these questions it kind of it kind of slips away oh it's fascinating oh good any other questions i'd like to compliment you on your slideshow i thought uh what you used uh, was excellent. Did you put that together yourself or did you have yeah. some professional help? Yeah, um, I, um, yes. And a lot of those were pictures that we couldn't get approval for to use in the book. So this was kind of, kind of for me, it was like, yeah, I can finally use these. This is great because I, like I said, you'd enjoy, I enjoyed, um, you know, finding this stuff and it was like all these little treasures and I can't use them, but oh, now I can. <laughs> Anything else? Denise, I just wanted to compliment you on your presentation style too. You were really engaging and um, it just was riveting. The whole oh, the good. whole story was just so exciting and fun to hear. And I, you've really got to, um, well, it, when you, I have in there um, some of the, the uh, uh, court transcripts where the, these women are, are presenting in court and you've got to, really got to read some of this because it's just, I mean, they do a, great job it's it's uh it's so fascinating and uh um i think the other thing that was really kind of rewarding for me was um if i hadn't written about them there were some things that came out um that a lot of people had missed before because nobody really looked into these women um as far as you know how they got got with the Dillinger gang and what what had happened and some things about the Dillinger gang that uh, that came out that I had never known before so uh, I'm surprised that um, a book that's never been written by Harry Pierpont yeah you know that's because he was the main I think the problem is I mean there you could do it I think the 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 um, um, when you're doing this kind of stuff, you really, who you're writing about, you really got to buy into them. Um, that was the thing I, when I, with Jesse and Bess, I mean, I, I could, I'm not an attorney, but you know, I could, I could feel for them in some of these, some of these instances and things, you know, you could really like, okay, I, I get this, you know, I mean, it's, it's not fun. You're coming into court and they're going to do a, a body search on you you know this is not a this is not a cool thing or it's not it's got to be frustrating when you stand up to talk and the national guard starts shooting off their guns you know it's just uh, it's it's crazy well the women you know members of the women members of the gang uh, they were treated more lightly than the men gangs if, a mem if somebody associated with the dillinger gang a man they would often throw them in jail, you know. And a woman, yes, they might get, you know, two years for harboring or assisting. Uh, I found that, you know, that's what I found out. Now, yeah, I think usually they didn't participate in robberies, but still. I, I think but the still, other thing, they, thing was, too, I, with the, the women, you definitely, um, uh, J. Edgar Hoover did not have a good track around record with, with women, you know, in the FBI or outside of the FBI. Um, the, they were trying to actually get Jesse for harboring. That was one of the things that they were, uh, one of the, the clubs I think they were holding over their head. But yeah, you're right, Jeff. I mean, how the, it, it was definitely, definitely a difference between stuff. But I did write a book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Dillinger Gang. So I was the first one to give a background of uh, each of the major members of the Dillinger gang. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and that's a great book. If anybody uh, hasn't read that, that's, that's another one that gives a really good, uh, good background. Uh, Luana just asked, do I, did I find that some of the research brought me closer to my grandmother? Um, I was pretty close. Grandma was kind of the black sheep of the family in a way, because again, keep in mind, uh, 
uh, everybody else was pretty pretty uh, respectable and, and uh, they kind of considered, boy, she was a sketchy character. And, and uh, it was interesting. Um, I, I regret, she lived to be 91 and I regret never talking to her again about Harry Pierpont. When we talked when I was 11 years old, I never asked the good questions. I just sat there, yeah, grandma, that's, that's. But uh, some of the stuff that she said about him was not in the local papers. And uh, I, I only figured it out after like, reading prison packets and books like uh, Jeff's, you know, that, my gosh, she did, she did actually probably meet him. It was like, oh my goodness. But, uh, so yeah, it, but you know what the nice thing was? It's a very, it, it, it's a good memory for me too. So any other questions? Well, well did you have any uh, times when you were frustrated and you couldn't find out something you really wanted to know in yes. your research? Yes. You'll, you'll have to read the book, but we've got, um, there had always been a rumor about a bribe that had gotten, um, that uh, they had paid the sheriff in Lima a bribe, and um, I had found some stuff, and then I, I can actually remember the day, it was March 17th, 2014, <laughs> that uh, I found something that really kind of, the final kind of piece of the puzzle came in on that. I mean, when you're researching this stuff, it's never, it, it, Jeff, you know, it's never, it doesn't come linear. You'll find something, you'll find something else. It, it, it isn't like a, a logical progression from A, B, C, D. And uh, when I found that, I was like, son of a gun, that explained a lot of, a lot of things. So. Yeah. And the women and the members of the gang, they were really useful to the gang because, you know, they could go rent apartments and go around yep. and do errands for the men. And and they they wouldn't be they wouldn't be notified you know they wouldn't be noticed mm -hmm. they wouldn't be in the papers you know. yeah so they it, did a really useful job for the male gangsters well it's kind of interesting too because one of the things I found out about Charlie Makeley was he was not adverse to having women help him on these jobs. So before he joined up with John Dillinger, he actually had a this kind of large <laughs> super gang, if you will. It was actually two different gangs. He had one in Ohio. He had one in Indiana. And uh, he uh, had women in both those gangs. And there's an instance, Lynn Grove, the second, uh, he ra robbed a bank in Lynn Grove, Indiana. And he robbed it twice, two years running. <laughs> it was kind of the, like within a week of each other, one year, like 1927 and 1928. And the second time he robbed it, he actually had two women come in with him. They were dressed as boys to help uh, hold the bank up. So, I mean, that's crazy. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's the Lingrove, uh, what uh, happened, that was actually how he got uh, 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 caught. Um, and it's, there's a lot of it that's in the, in the book, those, those kind of things, because it gives a background of how these, these gentlemen all got kind of into, into, into where, they, where they got. But uh, yeah, uh, Charles Makeley was an interesting, like I said, interesting character. Yeah, but I wish uh, people would, you know, write about Dillinger or Babyface Nelson, but the other major members of the gang, uh, there's a lot written about them, that, but there's no full length books about them. But they, uh, somebody should do that because they're very interesting careers. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, I glossed over kind of Hilton Crouch uh, just for the length of this presentation. But uh, um, what happened? He was in jail, and uh, Bess Robbins actually walked in on a jailbreak that he was trying to commit. That's in the book too. So I mean, it's you know, it's exciting times for these ladies. Who was doing the bank robbery? No, uh, jailbreak. Hilton Crouch. He was, uh, oh, oh. yeah, he was, he was trying to break out. He, um, and, uh, she walked in. Well, what had happened was, um, Bess got friends with his mother too, Mary Crouch. And Mary Crouch called him up one, called Bess up one morning and said, you know, Hilton really needs to get to the penitentiary. His mind will be better, much better at ease once he gets there. And it, she didn't come right out and say he's trying to break out of jail, but she kind of best read between the lines. So she went over to the jail and be darned. That's what, that's what he was doing. So. Oh, did he escape or did he get out of uh, jail? No, they, uh, they, uh, they, she caught him. Yeah. <laughs> so she and the gentleman that were the jailer oh. that was with her, taking her back there to see Hilton 
caught him in the act. So no, he didn't get he didn't get out. No. No. All right, Good. we are well, starting to run over. I want to be respectful of your time, Denise. So yeah. we need to take off. If anybody has any final questions, I don't want to hang on to you too long, but I think you definitely piqued everybody's interest. Good. Well, if you do have questions, think about them. I have a website, so uh, it's the Defending the Dillinger Gang, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you again, and thank well, you very I'll much. Your book. I'll thank buy you a book. <laughs> oh. um, there is a link in the chat box. If you guys would like to place the order for Denise's book, you'd be supporting her. You would also be supporting our adult literacy nonprofit, Indie Reads. Uh, so it's a win-win situation for everyone. Um, and then as Mariana pointed out, Denise, do you have uh, social media accounts where people can follow you in case they do have additional questions about the book? Um, the, uh, the publisher has one, but I, on, on Facebook, the website is probably the best, excuse me, the best way to, to get, get with me. Okay, so yeah, you guys can, uh, do a quick Google search. Um, Denise, I can't thank you enough again for joining us for Virtual Literary Society. Uh, I feel like I need to go watch a, a gang movie tonight. <laughs> all this. Well, well, thank you everybody for coming and I, I enjoy this. Guys. Again, like I said, it, it, I, I could talk all night about the Dillinger gang. Thank you, have a nice night. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody.